In Zechariah chapter 9, you're going to find a very interesting uh, part of this because in the beginning of Zechariah chapter 9, he says it's an oracle. And what that means is this is now going to be another section that Zechariah is proclaiming. Uh, we have already seen that God has given Zechariah at the beginning of this book different visions and with those visions to, for him to tell the people of things to come. And then we saw in one chapter where they were chastised for their evil deeds. And then last week you saw where they were told they would be blessed. And so God is not only going to just let them run wild, but He'll correct them and then He'll bless them as well. And today what we return to is this portion of Zechariah. Many Bible scholars and commentary writers will say that this was written probably near the latter part of his life. And so whenever you look at one chapter to the next, it doesn't just happen one day to the next. It could be many years. And so what we have here in chapter 9 is something that's happened many years after the first part we've already read. And so we're going in as we get ready to conclude Zechariah the next few weeks. You're going to be reading what he wrote at the latter part of his life. And when we get older in life, you know, sometimes we look at things a whole lot different. But with what he's going to give us now is not his own personal opinion. He's going to give us exactly what the Word of God has given him. And so today we're going to receive that. Zechariah chapter 9, starting with verse 1. Now what I want to do today, just to, so to keep you on track, is I'm going to read to you verse 1 through 8, and I'm going to stop. I'm going to give you a quick commentary on what's happening. But there's one particular verse in Zechariah 9 that I want to spend a, a, a great period of time on in the sermon, if you will let me do that. And in Zechariah, we're going to look at one verse that anyone that ever tells you that the Word of God uh, is not true. You can say, look, I can show you in one verse in the Old Testament that points not only to the truthfulness of God's Word, but also points to the truthfulness that Jesus is the Son of God. And I will show you that using Zechariah today, chapter 9. An oracle of the word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach and Damascus and is resting place for the eyes of men. And all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord. And also against Hamath and also the what borders it and as well as Tyre and Sidon. And thou, though they were screwed, Tyre has built herself a fortress she has heaped up silver like dust and gold like the dirt on the streets. Listen, the Lord will impoverish her and cast her wealth into the sea. She herself will be consumed by fire and Ashkelon will see it and be afraid. And Gaza too, and will right if and wither in pain and Eklon, her hope will fail. And there will be, cease to be a king in Gaza, and Ashkelon will also become inhabited. A mongrel people will live in Ashdod, and I will destroy the pride of the Philistines, and I will remove the blood from the mouths and the detestable things from between their teeth. And then they too will become a remnant for our God, and they will become like a clan in Judah, and Ekron like the Jezebusites, and I will set up camp at my house against an army, against those who march back and forth, and no oppressor will march against them. And again, for now I have seen with my own eyes. Now stop there for a moment. There's a lot of information about towns and villages and tribes that many of us don't talk about every day. If you do, you're probably one of the uh, very few people that would have these names in your conversation. But what's happening, Zechariah has been told by God that there are tribes, the names of these people, there are people that have been against God that are at the north part of Israel. These are tribes at the northern part. These are major cities, Tyre and Sidon. And he says, because they have been against Israel, God says, I will bring judgment upon them. Now around the year 300, and 20 or 332 to 331, so in that time period, God actually fulfills this scripture prophecy from Zechariah. And we know this to be true, not from biblical accounts, 
but from actually world history. If you've ever heard of Alexander the Great, these two cities that God says that He will bring judgment upon, Tyre and Sidon, He says in the city of the north that they will be destroyed. And they were. They were destroyed and conquered by Alexander the Great. And then Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, Ashdod, they are at the southern part of those cities. And believe it or not, God allowed them also to be conquered by Alexander the Great. Now, so what we see here is that what God is telling us is that His Word, when He says something's going to happen, it might not happen at that very moment, it might not happen the very next day, but it is happening. So you need to take hope today, just like when God says He will judge those that are against Him and they will be destroyed. You as people of God, we also need to take hope that when Jesus says, I will come again with a reward, I will come and bless you, I will call you my bride and bring you back to the home prepared for you, if He can keep this promise, then I will tell you something, He's going to keep that promise as well. There's no word in the Word of God from Genesis to revelation that God has broken His Word to His people. He is not a liar. He is one to be trusted. So in just one through eight was cities, towns, villages that were destroyed and God used Alexander the Great, historical person, to do His will. Even though Alexander the Great didn't realize he was doing what God had prophesied through Zechariah chapter 9. Now, here's one of those next verses I want to spend a little time on. It's Zechariah 9, 9. This is very important for you to memorize, for you to remember, and for you to basically put in your heart so that whenever you get discouraged, you need to realize when you start reading the Old Testament, sometimes we read it, and like I've said multiple times, we get all of this, this person begot that person, and and we think that the Old Testament can be hard and confusing, and at times it can be. I will be honest with you, it can. But we also need to know we can spend time in the Word of God, and thanks be to God that we can when we do, and we can discover that the Old Testament actually is telling us what will happen in the New Testament. So it points to what will take place. Zechariah 9.9 is a Mark your Bible verse, okay? And here's why. Listen to these words. And when you listen to these words from Zechariah 9.9, you tell me if you've ever read them before. Have you ever heard these words before? Maybe in Matthew chapter 21. Maybe in John chapter 12. Let's, let me read it to you and see if we can connect the puzzle pieces of the Old and New Testament. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion, shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Does that sound familiar? Nowhere in the Old Testament does this prophecy take place. This is a prophetic message in which Zechariah has been giving the hopeful words that there is coming a king that will ride in on this donkey. And Zechariah 9.9 is just as important as Matthew 21.5 and John 12.15. And the reason for that is simply this. If it had not been for Zechariah 9.9, we would say, well, he's just any ordinary person but we say, no, thanks be to God. Even Zechariah was told before Zechariah died, he was told, there is coming a king. You will not see him with your natural eyes, but there is coming a king. His name is Yeshua. He will ride in on that donkey that's never been ridden before, and because of that, he's going to go into a city. They're going to shout Hosanna. The same crowd that is worshiping and praising him, the same crowd will shout out, crucify Him later. But the good news is, because He was crucified, our sins can be washed away and forgiven. Now, if I could just spend a moment there. So when Zechariah 9.9, when it begins this part, it says, Rejoice. How? Rejoice greatly. Rejoice greatly. Many of you know what it looks like to rejoice greatly. Some of you know if you go to a ball game. Some of you know if you go to a NASCAR Some of you know if you catch the big fish, 
And some of you have caught that big fish, but somehow he jumped out of the boat before you could take a picture of it. You rejoice greatly whenever something good happens. We know what it means to rejoice. When we have a child, we rejoice and we let the world know. But hear what Zechariah says. It says, rejoice greatly. And he tells us the object. It says we are going to rejoice because our king is going to come. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Zion's important to know because because it is actually the mountain in which the city of Jerusalem is built upon. If you ever go there, a mountain in Hebrew, the word for mountain in Hebrew is tel, T-E-L. And you realize it doesn't mean it's got to be some large mountain. It just means it's a mound that's higher than regular ground level. But Jerusalem is built upon Mount Zion. But he says here, God says, for the people to rejoice... So many years later, what happens? Jesus rides into Jerusalem. He goes up on the Mount Zion. And the people do exactly that. They fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. The great thing I want to tell you today is that rejoicing greatly does not need to just be proclaimed in Zechariah 9.9. It does not need to just happen in Matthew's Gospel or John's Gospel. But Zechariah 9.9, we also should take from it that we as the church, the victorious people of God need to have a spirit that is rejoicing greatly. And sometimes it's hard to do. We are trying to get water out of that pump. We're like, okay, what's happening? What's happening? Why isn't any water coming out of it? Some of you are not old enough to know what that's like to be going to the well to pump out water. But some of you understand that that is a principle that you're saying, okay, what's taking place? But what if I were to tell you today that if you would just put a little water into it and to do to pump it, what's going to happen then if that water's there and then it gets lubricated, it gets wet and it goes down and you start pumping it, what happens? You're going to get a bigger investment than what you put into it. Amen? Any of you understand that? So could it be that Zechariah 9.9 is also pointing to Philippians 4.4 that says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And Paul says, again, I say, rejoice. And so how do we rejoice? We rejoice greatly. When do we rejoice? We rejoice always. You say, well, Pastor, I can't rejoice whenever I get bad news. When Brother David was up here talking about the family, the man he works with and his wife that had the miscarriage, you know, that's not a time you think about, well, let's rejoice. No, you're going to go through sadness. You're going to go through pain. But how can you rejoice? You rejoice to know this, that God still loves me even when I'm hurting. That God knows my pain. And you might say, well, God... How can he even uh, relate to that? God watched His only begotten Son go to an old wooden cross, be beaten, battered and bruised, bloody, mocked and ridiculed, and yet God watched it from afar. And as He watched it from afar, He knew His own Son who did not deserve to die. He watched that so that we could be forgiven. So does God know what it's like to lose a child? Absolutely He does. And for the wrong reasons. Today, I I want to just tell you, you can rejoice in all things. You might say to yourself, well, pastor, what about the financial world? I've met individuals that have lost it all. They had everything and they lost it all. And they will tell you, if they would be honest and they would come to you and just talk to you, if you're going through financial problems, they would tell you this, that I thought I had it all. And when I lost it all, I realized I still never had anything. And what I'm saying by that is these people thought they owned all these objects. But then when the bank came and changed the locks on the house, and I know that this for a fact has happened because I've seen it myself. I know for a fact people that I have been friends with had this happen. When the bank comes and says, you don't live here anymore. How many of you can rejoice and say, well, this door might be locked, but there's going to be a door in heaven that no man has the key to but God Himself, and He's not going to lock me out. Amen? You might say, well, pastor, when I lose all this kind of stuff, well, friends, you never had it anyway. When you die, you can't take it with you, can you? Absolutely not. Stop trying to impress the Joneses, because I promise you this, At the end of the day, the Joneses and the Smiths and everyone else that we might say we're trying to compare ourselves to, 
folks, they're not going to be who we stand before. It's just not going to happen. When we're young, I heard a very wise man say, when you're young, it seems like you want to accumulate, get, take. You want to have these things. And then when you get old, you realize those things meant nothing. Spend more time loving your family than more time trying to gather things that will just simply be thrown in the trash the day you die. But what do we do? We rejoice in the Lord always. You get up in the morning and you're hurting, guess what? Rejoice that you got a body to hurt. Because there's people today, I know you might say, well, what about my legs hurting? Well, let's get in the car. I don't have to drive too many miles to show you people that don't have all their limbs. And, and you got something to rejoice about. You might say, well, Pastor, I've got an earache. Well, rejoice because I can take you not too many miles from here and introduce you to people that cannot even hear and have to do sign language. You know, just think about it. We rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because the Lord changes not. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 10, the Bible says, Glory in His holy name. Meaning that we are rejoicing, we are bringing honor to His holy name. When you use the name of God, how do you use it? Do you use it like on Palm Sunday that Zechariah 9 9 is talking about and shouting, Behold, here comes our King, Hosanna! Or are you using the name of God in vain and saying, Crucify Him? Many of us use the name of God every day, but it's not in a holy way. Here in 1 Chronicles 16.10 it says, Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord do what? Rejoice! And so if you're seeking God, you can rejoice. My friends, if you're seeking to get a little closer walk with Jesus, you can rejoice because He will not abandon you. He will not leave you. He will not hurt you. He will not harm you. Because God Almighty loves you. And He says that I will tell you this, you can rejoice. Husbands can beat you and leave you. Wives can cheat on you and take everything you've got and ruin your credit score. But the Lord says, I will stick closer to you than a brother. I will love you greater than anyone in this world and so that we can rejoice in seeking Him. Amen, church? And Psalm 97, 12, it says, Rejoice in the Lord, all you righteous. So you sit here today and you might say, I have nothing to rejoice in. But here it says, if you're righteous... Well, Pastor, I'm not righteous. If you just go spend a few days with me. Well, my friends, yes, you are. If you are saved, if you are blood bought, if you are living that sanctified life because the Holy Spirit dwells with you, you are righteous. You say, Oh, no, I'm not righteous. Yes, you are, but it's because of Christ he has given you the right standing in the kingdom of God. No, we're not saved by works because our works are nothing more than filthy rags. We are saved because of the work of Christ. But we can rejoice because we have righteousness in Jesus. And the rest part of Psalm 97, 12 says, and give thanks to His holy name. If you don't know what to thank God for, just thank God that He is the great provider. Thank God He is the great shield. Thank God He is the great healer. Thank God He is the great I am. Thank God that He is is the door that allows us to get to Him. Thank God that He is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank God that Jesus Christ is the one who paid the price for us. In Psalm 68 verse 3, the psalmist wrote the following, But let the righteous be glad. There again is that word righteous. Let you be glad. Have you ever got around some Christians that you thought they're on the way to the funeral home? But they didn't seem like they were glad about anything. Now I'm not telling you to go to a funeral and be all up in there with a, a party hat and streamers and all that kind of stuff. People will think that's kind of weird too. The police might even investigate that. Well, what I am saying to you is that there's got to be a spirit of choice of being glad. I was glad when they said, let us go up into the house of the Lord. The Bible says also so many other things about being glad, glad tidings. But it says that we that are righteous can be glad. And why is that? Because in Psalm 68, 3, the remainder of that, it says, let them rejoice before God. When you sing these hymns that we sing, they are Scripture that was written to be sung by music. We're not singing it for the pianist. We're not singing it for the deacons. We're not singing it for the pastor. We're singing it to God. Amen? Amen. 
Someone said to me one time, someone I think a lot of and I love to death as my uh, friend and fellow worker in Christ said to me is that we were getting ready to play a, a song and, and, and I won't call out Tanya's name, but Tanya, uh, she was about to play and she said, well, hold on now, you're off key. So the thing was I was off key and I went home and I was telling Jessica about it and she said, okay, what's new about that? The thing is that I have to realize that whenever I rejoice to the Lord, I might sound like a bunch of alley cats out in the back. But I will tell you this, when we rejoice to God, regardless if we sound as good as Elvis Presley or we sound as bad as Ken Smith, God listens to our hearts and says it is, sounds good to me because He is rejoicing not in the things He can lose, but He's rejoicing in His hope and salvation. The rest of that Psalm 68.3 says, Yes, let them rejoice. How? Exceedingly. Meaning that you've got rejoicing coming out of you. Now I will be the first to tell you, I can complain. I can moan. I can bellyache just like everybody else can. I'm human like you are. But the thing we've got to do is that when we find ourselves in that attitude, seeing and complaining and moaning and groaning, We've got to remind ourselves we've got more to rejoice about than we do to complain about. Amen? I'm not immune to that. If you were to spend time with me, you understand that I can see things and and be like, Lord, is it ever going to happen? But I will tell you this, whenever the Lord does make it happen, we need to rejoice before it takes place. We need to rejoice why it's taking place. And we need to rejoice after the fact that God has done it. Amen. So what do we see? Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. And then it says, shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. The idea there of daughter is the idea that there is a sense of ownership, a sense of love. It's not someone else's child. We are called that person. We are called the family of God. God still has a purpose for Israel today. The reason why I know that is because the Bible says that there in Israel itself that the sky will open and the same Jesus who left will be appearing there in Israel one day. And my friends, we need to keep close watch because Israel is one of the places in the Bible that says it will still be there in end times. There will be in fact a new Jerusalem, a new heaven that will come down. And we need to understand that we as God's people need to stand with the people of Israel. And then it says, look, verse 9, your king is coming to you. The word there for king in Hebrew actually means exactly that, but it's more of a powerful statement of ruler. He is our ruler. Who sits on the throne of your life right now? You see, the people when Jesus, all that time later, when Zechariah wrote Zechariah 9.9, All that time later when Jesus then came in and fulfilled it in Matthew's Gospel that we read, what we know this is that they seem to have put Jesus on the throne. But the moment that Jesus was not the type of king they wanted, they put Him on the cross. How many of us know people that have gotten saved, or when I say saved, I mean I just simply mean they went through the motions for all the wrong reasons. Well, my friends, today I will tell you this, there will come a day that you will have to bow down because every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord, meaning that He is the King of kings. Jesus came in born of a, has a helpless baby. We know this. But understand that when Jesus returns, He returns as the victorious King for His bride. And there it says the next part, He is righteous and victorious. Thank God that He is because now today we have politicians that are nothing more than slimy, sinful, and only out for themselves. It is horrible today to realize that the average person that is a Christian does not want to get involved in any kind of the political arena because why? They say, well, Christians shouldn't get involved. We've had that mindset for so long that the churches took a step back and said, we'll let others 
run for office. We'll let others do this. And by doing so, we have stepped back and watched abortion become popular. We have stepped back and watched the Bible be ripped out of the schools. We have stepped back and watched the morals of a society go into the gutter. And then we want to wring our hands. We want to pace the floor and get mad at the world. Don't get mad at a sinner because they're a sinner. You don't walk by a dog that barks and get mad because the dog barks. That's what he's made to do. You don't walk by a kitty cat and the kitty cat go meow. And you get all mad because a cat was made a meow. So don't get mad when a sinner acts like a sinner. The problem is the church. That's the problem is the church. The problem is, is that the world is acting like it should and the church wants to act like the world. And then we wonder why nobody wants to come to church. Why should you come to church? If the church looks like the world, sounds like the world, acts like the world, dresses like the world, talks like the world, I wouldn't want to be there either. When I was in the Lions Club, we sang a hymn before we had our meeting. We had a prayer before our meeting. We even said, does anybody know that we're sick? Before when we had had our meeting, we'd have a guest speaker come in to encourage us, to challenge us to do more for the blind people in the community. It was almost like a religion. We were no different. We'd go and eat, we'd celebrate, we'd go home and, and do our works. I was part of that. And there's nothing wrong with being part of that. But understand, the church is not the Lions Club. The church is not Kiwanis. The church is not the Lodge. The church is not the Shriners. The church is the Bride of Christ. Amen? Well, I would preach to you today, but I'm going to try to keep it calm. And then it says in the next part of verse 9, I hope you're taking all this in. It says, He is righteous and victorious. In the next part it says, another description of the one that's riding in on the donkey. He is humble. Jesus has all reasons to hold His head up high. Jesus has all reasons to be able to stick out His chest. He is the Creator. In the beginning in Genesis says, let us create man in our image. Jesus was there in the very beginning. He has all reasons to do that. But Jesus is humble coming in because He is the sacrifice that's being ridden in on this animal. Not just some animal that was just pulled out of the field. This is an animal that was a purebred. If you go and really study the details about this animal, you find out it's never been ridden. This animal that was already from the time the animal was born, it was destined to ride the king into the city. This donkey, Zechariah 9.9, God knew about it at 9-9 as He did whenever Jesus saddled up the donkey and went into the town. Think of that. Even something as simple as a donkey was prophesied in Zechariah 9-9. Are you loving the Word of God? But He's humble in that. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The humble king comes riding in on the donkey. And why? Because he's bringing salvation with him. In John 14 verse 6, the Bible says, Jesus said unto him, you should have this memorized and tattooed on your heart. Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one, no man, no woman, no black, no white, no Hispanic, no illegal, no foreigner, no one comes to the Father except through me. And that's Jesus saying Him. In Titus 3, 5, the Bible says, He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, He didn't save you because of how good you look. He didn't save you because of something you could do and give Him. He saved you not because of the righteous things we had done, but it continues in Titus 3, 5. But He saved us because of His mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 7, 25 says, Therefore, He is always able. He's always able. 
You remember years ago there was a commercial that came on and there was a hotel. And in that hotel's commercial, part of what they would say on it is that you come on and see us. It was Tom Burnett. He said, come on and see me. We're going to leave the light on for you. Who was that? Motel 6. Motel 6. But I'm going to tell you something. What if, and I'll bend down, you remember when Mississippi and Louisiana and those areas got flooded so bad years ago, over 10 Year, it was about 12 years ago, I guess. I went with a group and went down there with Baptist men to help in that situation. Never knew that years later we'd see it in our own backyard. But they had Motel 6s then. And in that Motel 6, we went into Biloxi, and, and guess what? There was no power. Yeah, some of you are going to get this. And so, no power at the Motel 6. I don't care if the ad on the television said they were going to leave the light on. They could leave the light on, but they didn't. They might have turned the switch on, but there was no power. I will promise you this, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. It says that we are saved by His works, meaning that we are saved through the promises He has made. When Jesus promised it is done, when He was on the cross, it was better than the ad on television that said we'll leave the light on because there will come a time that the power company might have the power off and there is no light. Jesus says, I am the light. Let's wrap it all up. I know my time's getting quick, but it's okay. And then it says the following, Revelation twenty two seventeen. But the Spirit of the Bride says, Come. Anyone who hears should say, Come. Who's invited to come to salvation? Anyone. Everyone. Your neighbor who you might not like is invited to come. The politician that you wish would get voted out of office still has the invitation to come. It says anyone who hears should say come and the one who is thirsty should come. It does not mean a natural thirst. The Bible says he who thirsts shall drink freely from the well of life. What that is is that if you're seeking God, He will refresh you, He will bless you, not from a well that will run dry, but from the Holy Spirit itself. It says the one who is thirsty should come. Whoever desires should take the living water as a gift. You who are saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb, you have been given the gift of this living water. Let's continue. The last remaining part of Zechariah you find out what it tells us. It says, I will cut off the chariots of Ephraim and the horses from Jerusalem. The the bow of war will be removed and He will proclaim peace to the nations. His dominion will extend from the sea to sea, from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of your covenant, I will release your prisoners from the waterless cisterns. Here it's talking about those whales that had no water. When we turn to anyone other than God, we're going to a well that has no water. Return to a stronghold, you prisoners. You have hope today. I declare that I will restore double to you, for I will bend Judah as my bow, and I will fill the bow of Ephraim, and I will rouse your sons Zion against your sons Greece, and I will make you like a warrior sword, and then the Lord will appear over them, and His arrow will fly like lightning. The Lord God will sound the triumph trumpet and advance to the southern storms. Now, the reason the reason why none of this is quoted in Matthew's Gospel and John's Gospel is because although in chapter 9 verse 9 has came to come to pass, what we read from verse 10 on is still yet to come. It's He's coming again. The enemies of the Lord as He destroyed them the first time through Alexander the Great, He says, I will come again. But who will do the fighting? The Lord of hosts. God will fight the battles. He will destroy the enemy. And then let's continue. The Lord of hosts, verse 15, will defend them. Notice that. He's the one doing it. They will consume and conquer with slings, stones, and they will drink and be rowdy as if with wine. 
and they will be as full as the sprinkling basins and like those at the corners of the altar. And the Lord their God will save them on that day and the flock of His people, for they are like jewels in a crown. So He saves them because why? Jewels in a crown means they're precious. You know, you're precious in a good way. It says this, it says, continuing sparkling over His land. In verse 17, and we're done. How lovely and beautiful they will be. What makes it so beautiful, the people of God, is not because of anything we've done. What makes us beautiful is that we've been clothed in His righteousness. The Master. The Grand One who created all has done it. He has built something that can never be reproduced. And that is salvation. He has done the work. And it says, how lovely and beautiful they will be. It says, grain will make the young men flourish and new wine the young women. Meaning there will be a spirit of the time in which God will bring a renewing power to them. Can I close with a statement and then we'll give the invitation. My favorite author, other than what's written in the Bible. And I encourage you to read some of his stuff. I know one brother has purchased one of his books and was reading it. C.S. Lewis wrote, If you want to get warm, you must stand near the fire. If you want to get wet, you have to jump in the water. If you want joy... You must get close to God. You see, whenever Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah 9 9, that was fulfilled in Matthew 21 and John 12, the people seemed like they had joy, but it wasn't true joy. They seemed they were close. They shout, Hosanna, behold, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It took palm branches and they laid it down. They looked like they were as close as they could be to the Lord. He rode in as the humble sacrifice. They had no clue of that though. I wonder how many of them even understood Zechariah 9.9. 9. You might say, well, pastor, of course all of the Jews at that time understood what was happening. No, they didn't because if they did, they would not have cried out, crucify him. You see, they had the Torah, they had the Word, but they did not apply the Word. We have the whole Word, all 66 books of it. How much of it are we applying to our lives? And then we look around and we see all the craziness in the world, and then we're like the kid on Home Alone when he tries to shave and puts on aftershave, and we slap our face and say, Ah, I can't believe this is happening! Why can't you believe it's happening? Just read your Bible! At the end of the times, men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of evil, lovers of darkness. They will turn away. They will crucify those who call out for good. They will stone those who preach the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. At the end of the times, there will be two witnesses that will come down and they will call the world to repentance. And the book of Revelation says these two witnesses that they will be killed in the streets of Israel there in Jerusalem and that the people will pass out gifts like it is Christmas Day because they thought they did the great work and it says they were excited about it. My friends, today the church is under persecution and we act like we're surprised about it? Why? If Zechariah 9.9 came to fruition, why do we think not that the words of Jesus and the words of John and Revelation won't also come to fruition? Behold your King! Look upon Him. Look upon Him for what? Your healing? Do you need to be healed? Tanya, come on up. Look upon your king. Behold, do you need joy? Look upon your king. Do you need restoration in your marriage? Behold, your king. Look upon him. What is it you need? Well, my friends, today the invitation is just as simple as I can make it. 
If you're looking to Jesus simply for joy, if you're looking for Jesus simply to help you in your finances, if you're looking for joy and simply restoring because Jesus can restore the marriage, if you're looking for healing and you're looking upon Him for anything other than salvation first, then we're no more different than the people that shouted, Hosanna! And one week later, crucify Him. Look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Let's pray.